Welcome to Worship Christ Lutheran Church. I am so excited to be worshiping with you on this beautiful Sunday morning in Whitefish, Montana. Um, I want to welcome those of you who are listening in on the radio. If this is your first time with us, we are so excited to have you worshiping with us. And we just thank you so much for tuning in. So let's worship our King. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we are a restless people. As the weight of the world increases, we look everywhere for release. We confess today that we have not found solutions to our problems or deliverance from our burdens in our own strength or resources. We desire peace. Our hearts need a resting place where the worries of everyday life are in perspective and where the sin of our life can be forgiven. Lord, forgive us and give us peace. Our God is a God of peace. God says, come to me all who are tired from carrying heavy loads and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will find rest. The peace we desperately seek is ours through Christ Jesus. The weight of our sin has been taken by him in his death and resurrection. Through the cross we are forgiven and set free to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen.
are nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. shouting for a physical wall to come down but we may have other walls we are not able to bring down in our own might relational walls walls that obstruct opportunities walls created by limited finance or strained health despite any barriers you identify in your current situation don't let them come between you and God cry out to him the one who can bring down the walls completely with his strength and healing. Shout to the Lord. Never 
Join me as we pray together the prayer of the day. Father, we bow before you as our wise and mighty leader. You know the best paths for us to take and the best strategies to use in battling our enemies. Thank you for your patience with us so many times as we try to figure out things before taking steps of obedience. Help us to grow in our relationship with you and learn to take steps of faith more boldly, trusting you for the results. We pray this in the victorious name of Jesus. Amen. And we invite the children to tune in now for our children's message. Good morning, boys and girls. Do you guys know what I have right here? Can you see that on your screens? This is just regular old water. And so what do we do with water? What can we do with water? What are some things? So some things I came up with are we can drink it. We can swim in it, which is now is tis the season for that. We can cook with it. How do you make your pasta without water? You can bathe in it, which is important. Hygiene is important. So water is pretty powerful stuff. And did you know that your body is largely made up of water? Approximately 50 to 75% of your body is water. So that's why it's important to stay hydrated. But when I think of water, I also think of baptism, like we're going to be talking about later today, and like we're actually going to be doing in our parking lot service outside this morning. So what is baptism? Baptism helps us remember that God has saved us and washed away our sins. So people do baptism differently. Some people sprinkle water onto others. Some people dip all the way in. And some people are baptized as little babies. And some people are baptized when they're older. There are lots of ways to do it. 
But it is wonderful and important to be baptized because it shows us that we are new in Christ and baptism gives us a new identity in Jesus. So here I have this white t-shirt and I have, I don't know if you can see this, but this is purple. Hopefully you can see that it's purple. And I have these because they are the same thing, but they are different colors. And so this purple shirt, before it was dyed purple, was most likely probably white. So if I were to add some dye to this water, like you dye your Easter eggs with, or you tie-dye with, it would turn purple. And you could dip like a white t-shirt or a white cloth into that, and it would become purple. And so in Jesus' day, many people would wear purple as a symbol of wealth or honor, um, and that is how they identified and so much like this t-shirt here, when we are baptized or when it is dipped, we have a new identity in Jesus and it has a new color. So it is worn as honor. So you see, we are born as sinful and we'll most likely do a lot of bad things in our lives, whether we mean to or not. But we can be rest assured that God will forgive us when we ask for his forgiveness because of Jesus. He sent Jesus to take our place and to die so that we could live with him forever. Did you know that Jesus was also baptized? Now that might seem kind of strange because Jesus never sinned. He was perfect. So why would he need to be baptized, right? Well, John asked the same question. Do you guys remember John? He was the guy who wore camel hair and he ate the locusts. Well, he baptized people in a river. And Jesus came to him one day asking to be baptized and John tried to send him away because he's Jesus. Why does he need to be baptized? He's perfect. But in, Jesus insisted, saying that he needed to do it. And so that lets us know that baptism is a blessing and a really great thing. And when Jesus was baptized, something remarkable happened. Heaven opened up and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove. And the voice of God was heard saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So all parts of the Trinity were present at once. And God was announcing who Jesus was his beloved son. So we can take heart that Jesus was and is who he proclaimed to be, that he is comforting, and that that is a comforting reminder. He is comforting, and that's comforting to know that he is who he says he is. And he lived and died so that we might be able to have eternal life, and that we can be made clean and new in him, much like my purple t-shirt was made new when it was dipped. So this is something that we should remember to help us live joyfully every single day that we are made in God's image and we can live in his presence. We are sinful, but we can be cleansed in Christ. So the next time you wash your hands or you make your pasta or you take a bath, let's remember how God washed away our sins. So why don't we thank him for that right now? Dear Jesus, thank you for the gift of baptism. Thank you that baptism that we can celebrate today, and thank you for your son, Jesus. We are so grateful that because of his sacrifice, we can be washed clean. May we be reminded to find our identity in you today and every day. We love you. Amen. So I'm also reading your scripture this morning. So if you want to grab your Bibles, and we're going to open to Joshua 6. And we're going to be reading verses 6 through 16 today. So I'll give you a second to do that. So starting in verse 6, it says, So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, <clears throat> Advance, march around the city, with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, bowing their trumpets, sorry, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices and do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. 
So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priests shouted or sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome. Let's pray. We just heard the word of the Lord, and let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you for what you have done. And not only for what you have done, but for who you are. You are our creator, our maker, who knows every fiber of our being better than we could ever know ourselves. You are the one who has saved us. And in and through Jesus Christ, you are our savior our Redeemer, our Waymaker, the one who has brought us back from the powers of sin and death and the grave, and you are our sanctifier, the one who builds us up and bears fruit through us, who transforms us that we might walk in the way of Jesus Christ, made to be more and more in the image and likeness of Christ himself. So, Lord, in this time now, may you do just that. As this word takes root in our hearts and in our lives, Holy Spirit, speak through these ancient words. Speak your truth. Speak your life. And may that be made manifest in us and through us now. And we give thanks in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. It's so great to see everybody this morning. And I know that's kind of a weird statement because we can't actually see each other. But outside in the parking lot, I can see lots of people. And, uh, and you can see me. But we can be very, very thankful for platforms like social media where we can stream and connect that way and receive God's word it's amazing. I just want to say thank you to those of you who have asked how Carrie is doing in this pandemic um, and how I'm doing. So many people in the community within our congregation have asked, and, and, uh, and it's just been awesome, to be honest with you. I know that things have even gotten more tense, Right? As we've seen changes in the Flathead, and this, this last week we've had a, a new mandate come out from the city council, and yet we serve an all-powerful God who transcends everything. The word describes God as one whose dominion lasts from everlasting to everlasting. And we've been learning about this God in Joshua as we look at the story of Israel and how this powerful God has taken a people and essentially consecrated a people for himself. He's revealed who he is. And as he's done that, as he's delivered Israel from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, a transformation in this people has taken place. And it's been nothing short of miraculous. And so that's this God that we serve. That's this God who we worship. And as God reveals himself, we are transformed. That's the theme for today. As God's identity is revealed, our identities are formed. I've been so excited to share what God has laid on my heart just been looking forward to it. Um, 
sometimes God moves in us, right? And, and uh, sometimes we, we experience that through worship. Sometimes we experience that through hearing of the word. Sometimes through prayer and fellowship. Um, you know, when we come to Jesus Christ, it says that the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us and he indwells us. But yet Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Because presumably we're not always filled with the Spirit. The word also says that we can grieve the Spirit of God. And so, during this season, I don't know about you, but I hope, I hope that it's been for you like it's been for me. This transformation has taken place in my heart. I feel like I have just this deeper love for Jesus Christ. And as he's revealed himself to me, and as I've sought him in prayer, there's been this filling up. And God has revealed to me more and more about who he is. You know, and, and that's been my prayer for, us, for our congregation, for this community, right? Just, just this prayer from Colossians chapter 1. And it's, it's nothing that I can teach you or that any pastor can teach you. It's nothing that we can learn as people, as Paul describes it here. There's this knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding that only comes from the Father. And it starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. That's where it started for me. And that's where the root of it is. And so I hope, I hope that's been your prayer life as well. I really do. And so last week, we saw how God has revealed himself to Joshua specifically. Joshua confronts the seemingly ordinary man. And he says, are you for me or are you against me? Are you for us or are you against the armies of Israel? And, and, and the man says, no. And then his identity is revealed. This mystery man, as Pastor Byron introduced him, reveals his identity as the commander of the host of the armies of the Lord. And a miraculous transformation takes place in Joshua, and we see him fall down on his face. And this change from confrontational to receptive happens. And as he's there worshiping, he says, what do you have to say to your servant? And there's this transformation. And it's in this transformation, as God reveals who he is, that Joshua gets this strength and this courage and even this instruction that he might step out in faith and obey something that seems completely illogical. I mean, none of us would come up with a strategy of conquering a city, right? Of marching around the city and blowing trumpets and giving a shout to make the walls come down? That's completely ridiculous. But yet as God reveals himself to Joshua, as he reveals himself to the sons of Israel by parting the waters of the Jordan, this transformation takes place and they're ready to obey. They're ready to do the ridiculous for God. Whatever he asks. And so as God's identity is revealed, our identity is formed. There's a lot of stuff here on the table. Ordinary things. Just like the man who Joshua first confronted was ordinary. God uses ordinary things to reveal himself. It's amazing. Jesus, God in the flesh, comes as an ordinary baby. And we get a story. It seems so ordinary in our culture, right? We have the movies and cinemography. We've got the New York Times bestseller list. We've got papers. We've got story. And God reveals himself in story. And as we come to the story of God, the living word, we're formed by it. He reveals his identity and our identity is formed. And it happens with the Holy Spirit. And it happens with the sacrament. It happens with the sacrament as well. You know, during this last season, as the call committee has been 
doing its work. And just a brief update on the call committee and, and the process that we're in. You know, we've got pastors applying for a job, right? Applying for a job as our senior pastor. And what happens in an application process? People reveal their identity. They submit resumes, and then they go through interviews, and they go through face-to-face -face meeting processes, and in, in that transaction, we hear about their story. And the potential employer, in our case, the call committee, right, we go through a transformation. And there's this relationship that begins to form. And a change takes place. And for us as a call committee, we pray, Lord, change our hearts in such a way that we feel a calling. And whoever is applying, Lord, would you just move them to a place where they feel called? And so, even in that type of a transaction, identity is revealed. And as we get to know the person, transformation happens and we feel called to them. And that's the work that's going on in the call committee. I just want you to let, let you know that. We've been interviewing and we've been reviewing resumes and now we're in the process of meeting candidates face to face. And it is exciting. God is moving. He's at work. He's at work. I just want to give you that brief update. It, it kind of goes along with the theme of what we're talking about here. You know, and so, as we connect how God is revealing who he is through sacrament, through the word, through the Holy Spirit, my prayer this morning is that you would really consider what this stuff means what this ordinary, ordinary stuff on the table is. It's sacrament. It's sacrament. And the most original translation of that term sacrament, if there is one word that captures its meaning and significance, it's mystery. It's mystery. Not a mystery in the sense that we can't grasp and understand it, like some cloud of smoke, but actually a mystery in the way that we can actually take hold of it. It's like faith, the conviction of things not seen, something that we can grasp and possess and experience. You know, and sacrament isn't something that's routine, but it's meant to be experienced and embodied. And it's so beautiful, again, how our all-powerful, eternal, uncomprehensible God who is spirit and we think of we think of him and we sing of him the way scripture describes him in all his splendor and his spirit and he chooses to reveal himself to us in material things that are so ordinary he takes simple stuff that's well known and is used commonly by man and has been throughout the millennia And he says, I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm going to teach you who I am. I am going to form you as my own through these things. God says, I'm going to reveal myself in and through these things so that you may know me as your deliverer, as your redeemer, and as your sanctifier. He says, if you will listen, if you will learn, if you will receive, I will show you who I am, and I will form you into who you were created to be. It's so easy to just approach these items as routine, as an add-on. But that's not how God intended for them to be. Does that interest you? To be formed by God? Does that compel you? I ask because sacrament, especially the Lord's table, can be so divisive. It has been throughout the ages. And I'm not going to lecture today about the Baptist view or the Catholic view or, or even we as Lutherans, even the Lutheran view. But I want to go deeper. I want to get to the heart of where all this begins. Because once we begin to let these sacred things become about ourselves, the whole point is gone. The whole point is gone. It just is. It becomes about us. 
and not at all about God. And if God has said, this is one of the ways that I make myself known to you, this is a way that you may know each other, then as soon as it ceases to be that, it becomes useless for the purposes of God. And in fact, worse than that, it becomes a tool in the enemy's hands for division. They become ways in which we actually fail to understand God and understand who God has meant for us to be. And as we look at this mystery, as we consider these things, water, oil, bread, the fruit of the vine, it it doesn't mean that these things are magical or have some inherent power in and of themselves, not at all. When we take these everyday elements and we consecrate them and dedicate them to God, we're asking Him to use them. We're asking Him to move in and through these things to make known to us the deeper reality of who he is and whose we are. And that's why they're gifts of God for the people of God. And you'll hear us pastors talk about them in that way. And so we come together like this and we sing and tell the story of God and we remember. And we're taken back to a historical faith. And all these elements are in some way meant to tell God's story again. They're meant to tell God's story in a way that shapes us and forms us and unites us as the body of Christ now to form us as his people individually yes but don't forget corporately as well we alone are not the body of Christ but rather we're part of the greater people of God the church that is grafted into God's people and set apart for his purposes and for his works and for his glory. The one who God said, you shall be my light to the world through whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So all of this is meant to understand, help us to understand that story and to tell that story again and how God's identity is revealed in it and how through faith alone our identity is formed by it. And so, for instance, and so, for instance, we see the bread. And this is what I want to make sure that we understand, that the form isn't what's so important. Whether it's a wafer that comes on a plate, as all of you received earlier, who are in the parking lot, and if you didn't, well, put up your hand, and maybe you all have them at home right now, a wafer, or you have some form of bread. And whether it's flat bread such as this or a loaf, the point is, is what is bread? Christians, as we see bread in this context, what do you think of? What do you think of? The bread of life. The body of Christ given for you. Bread's a staple. It's something that's consumed by human beings, and it has been throughout the ages in so many different fashions and forms. Whether it's bread from Ceres Bakery or biscuits and gravy at the Buffalo Cafe after church, bread is something that's one of those staple elements, one of those things that brings sustenance and nourishment, and it supports life. And so on that night, the Passover meal when Jesus was seated with his disciples in that upper room. They were celebrating what they had celebrated most of their, if not all of their lives at that time every year. And they remembered bread that was eaten that night when God's judgment passed over the houses of Israel as they were slaves in Egypt. And they remembered what it meant for their ancestors to be in the wilderness for 40 years and the manna, that mysterious bread from heaven that God alone provided. It nourished them and it sustained them for 40 years. And that's the story, the story they would have known, the story they would have remembered in that upper room that night, the story that was actually forming them, shaping them, making them into the people of God. And Jesus, what does he do? He continues the story. He continues the story and he tells it something like this as John tells it. He says, I am the living bread 
who came down from heaven and whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that, that I will give you, the bread that I give the world is my flesh. Talk about mystery, right? Now this is something that if you read in the context of John's gospel, plenty of Jesus' followers say, whoa, this is crazy. I'm out of here. And so as the people were leaving, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, will you leave also? And Peter says, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where will we go? <laughs> and Jesus said crazy things, and we'll talk about the blood here in a minute, but Jesus said, unless you eat of my flesh, unless you drink of my blood, I have no part with you, and you have no part with me. And so something happens in the mystery of how Jesus takes this bread. And as Matthew and Luke tells us, he says things like, this broken bread is my body given for you. Take and eat all of you and do this in, remember? In remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And the story continues. And so Jesus, is he really talking about bread now? Or is there something more? Is there something deeper to the mystery? Is there something more that Jesus is talking about than just simple bread? And I think the answer is obvious at this point. And yet, how do we begin to understand? Because with that bread, with that bread comes the cup, the fruit of the vine. Again, the form we receive it in is far less important than what this is meant to teach us. What it is meant to show us, how it is meant to reveal who God is in us, right? In the same Passover meal, and there were four cups in the Passover meal. And the cup after supper, as Luke tells it, Jesus said, this cup is poured out for you. And it is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins for many. Again, how are we supposed to understand this? As he continues to say, and he says, as often as you drink of it, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And there's that phrase again, in remembrance of me. His sacrifice, his death, and we get that. We understand that much, right? His shedding of his own blood for us. His shedding of his own blood for us. And yet in our culture, a culture of stories with books and cinemography and media full of horror and gore, blood has become to ubiquitously mean death. And there's no way for us to understand without somebody telling us that in ancient Israel's time, blood was actually seen as the source of life in a living creature. As blood moved, as blood flowed, it was seen to be the storehouse of life. And so even when blood would come, blood was seen to be the source of life, not death. And as Western thinkers in the 21st century, we don't see that, we don't get that. And this is why it's so important and when an animal was sacrificed in ancient times, why this was happened was because that blood was meant to be returned to its source, returned to its creator. Blood was seen as sacred. And that's where life was understood to be reposited. And so stop now and think about that with Jesus himself, speaking of the new covenant in his blood. He's speaking of his death, yes, but he's speaking even more powerfully about his life. His life that was given, his life that was poured out, his life that is necessary for us to receive and to walk in and to understand this new covenant. And do you know what the, the new covenant is? This isn't something that Jesus made up. It predates him by centuries, absolutely. It's one of those things that 
as we see how Jesus would talk about this life-giving relationship, that's what a covenant is. A covenant is the way God defines the terms of a relationship with his creation, and especially with people, with his people. And so when it comes from Jesus, he was very much quoting as we hear it from Jeremiah in chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. They will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so Jesus is saying that the old days of the old covenant are past and the new covenant is here. The days when I will put my law within them and write it in their hearts, my Torah, which we translate as law, but maybe a better translation is my teaching my instruction, my way. Remember what Paul prayed for, for the Colossians? That we would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with spiritual wisdom and understanding. God's Torah, God's teaching. And they shall know me intimately, for I will forgive them and hear this and remember their sins no more. Every time, every single time we come to the cup and we hear Jesus' words, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, we should remember God's story. That's what we're to think about. We should remember the words spoken through the prophet Jeremiah almost 600 years before Jesus ever took a step on this planet. Talk about a God who is faithful. Talk about a God who is a way maker, a miracle worker, and a promise keeper. We don't just sing those words and the melody for the joy of it. Rather, we celebrate who God is and what he has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We celebrate whose we are. And that's who God is. That's whose we are. Do you see? Do you see what this is meant to do when we receive communion at the Lord's table? We don't take communion, but rather we receive it. He's always asking us to receive who he is that we might be transformed by it, by him. And that's what it's all about. That's what's at the heart of this. And so when you receive his broken body, when you receive his shed blood, it's not about a wafer or juice, no. But you're actually receiving Jesus Christ. Do you yearn for him? Do you long for him more than anything to take him in and let him fill you to the full? By giving us his table, Jesus says, take me in and be filled in such a way that you cannot help but be changed. you cannot help but be transformed do you receive that do you desire that more than anything else Paul said he longs to know the love of Jesus not just a head knowledge but to be unified with him to be made clean and to be one with him David said if there's one thing I long for it's to dwell in the house of the Lord and in the presence of Jesus Christ That's what David is talking about. I want to be in the house of the Lord forever. That trumps everything. And God does this in other ways too. In these sacramental elements like oil. Simple olive oil. It was a common staple in Jesus' day. And it's become more of a staple here in America not just because others have brought it from other parts of the world, but because we've seen the many practical purposes. 
It's tasty on salads and we use it for dining. It soothes and it comforts. It can act as a solvent and clean. Absolutely. We've seen it in the language of anointing as well. And in the way that God pours out his presence in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And so we anoint with oil as we pray for healing. And as we incorporate anointing in the process of blessing. And as we ask God for his special presence in our lives. Again, there's no magic or mystical power in the oil, but rather it's representative of Jesus sent, our comforter. It represents who God is as he reveals how he works in our presence on our behalf. And as God reveals himself, we're formed in and through the comforting presence of his Holy Spirit. Remember how David said in Psalm 23, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. And what goes right with that is, thou anoints my head with oil. God soothes, God blesses, God lavishes himself upon us. And the oil reveals who he is and who we were formed to be. And of course, water, a basic element of life, as Kendra shared earlier, comprises roughly 60% of our body, give or take. But stop and think about what water is for a minute. What water is to life on this planet. Think about what it does for us. Water. It supports life. And we talk about being buried in the waters of baptism. God takes this water, and through baptism, we're buried with Jesus in his death, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may be raised to walk in newness of life. Water not only brings life, but it brings new life in that way. We were buried in the waters like we might be buried in a tomb. We're going to have two baptisms today out in the parking lot. And ideally, we would immerse somebody in the water so that they would spring forth out of that in a way that we see Jesus first and as something that's promised for us. That we'll be raised from the dead on that great and glorious day of resurrection. But right now, there's a spiritual resurrection that we're all called to what it means to be born again, what it means to be born from above, formed by Jesus, the living word. Baptism, talk about something that's meant to give us identity. Talk about something that's meant to shape us. And remember what Paul says, that he has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness and rescued us and brought us into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of his glorious light, and this by faith through grace in Christ alone. Baptism is what shows us in the physical what God has done in the spiritual. And what about washing of feet? What about washing of feet? As we read in John's Gospel, at the Last Supper, when Jesus takes the towel and the basin and he gets down on his knees and he washes his disciples' feet. He humbles himself and he says, now you do as I have done. And that's one that I think we like to make a little bit more of a mystery than it is. You know, am I talking about washing feet literally? Sure. But it's so much more than that. What does it mean for us to recognize when Jesus says, if you search for me, you will find me in the least of these who you humbly serve? 
Will you do as I have done, Jesus asks? Will you follow me? Will you adopt my attitude? Will you lower yourself and put others before yourself? Will you be the one who sacrificially loves and serves as I have loved you? And that's how water in that way reveals to us who God is and how he intends for us to be formed by his example. And so this is what our holy God does. He reveals himself to us in all these different ways that we might be formed into the likeness of Jesus Christ himself. He revealed himself so powerfully to Joshua and the sons of Israel. And as we hear the preaching of his word and as we receive the gift of the sacrament and as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, God shapes us. He forms us. So now, as we come to the Lord's table, as we actually receive the body of Christ, as we eat of the flesh of Jesus, as he would say, I want you to think about the deeper meaning. I want you to take him in. We invite anyone who confesses faith in Jesus Christ as the King, as the God of the universe, as the, as the Lord himself who conquered death to share and partake. And so Jesus, on that night in the upper room, and if you're at home watching, take your bread and prepare yourselves and ask the Lord to come in. And Jesus says, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Do this in the remembrance of me. And so as you serve one another at home, serve and say to each other and think of the deep meaning the body of Christ given for you and again on that night in the upper room Jesus took the cup and he said this is the new covenant in my blood that is shed for you and wherever you are with the cup that you've prepared Take and think of the blood that was shed, the life that Jesus gave. He said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins for many, the new covenant. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. So we celebrate the Lord's table in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And this brings us to the heart of our faith and we confess the things that we have examined here today using the Apostles' Creed. Using the Apostles' Creed. And so let's confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. It's time for us to take our offering. for us to pray so please bow with me as we pray together Father in heaven thank you so much that you reveal yourself to us that you come to us with the intention of forming us into the people of God Help us to see you for who you are, for who you've revealed yourself to be. Father, thank you for taking ordinary things that we can understand, that we might receive you and be formed by you, even though it's a mystery, Lord. It's your knowledge and your spiritual wisdom that you give. Help us to receive it. Lord, thank you so much for shedding your blood on the cross that we might be forgiven and made one with you. You know our every need. You're our provider, our sanctifier, our redeemer. Lord, you know this congregation, this people, and everything that they bring to you, everything that they confess. You know us more intimately than we could ever know ourselves. And so we ask for your help, Lord. For in your Son, Jesus, there is no fear. Whether we're walking through a transition, searching for a new pastor, whether we're walking through a transition, facing a pandemic, whether we're walking through transitions in family, in education, and in government, Father, help us to know you in those moments that we might cast our cares upon you and receive your peace that passes all understanding. And so we ask for your strength, Lord. For those in leadership positions, we ask that you would give wisdom. And Father, for those in serving positions, we ask that you would give love and tenderness and gentleness. And Lord, for those who are broken in need of your healing touch, we ask that you would bring your power and transform them, even in their body, but especially in their soul, that they might come into a deeper relationship with you. 
Give us your strength, Lord. So many individuals, they have needs, and we've been praying for them. Father, would you attend to those prayers? We know that you love us, and we know that you hear us. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. Would you give us a conviction to be in it, that we might know you more, that we might be obedient to you, and Lord, would you open the hearts of those who, who hear your word and give us the strength and the words that we need to speak your truth. Father, we ask for your blessing in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine on you, and give you peace. Amen. With our Joshua theme, let's march around those walls, march in the light of God, in the love of God, and in the power of God. into the world.